This is Dennis McMahon and welcome to Positively Vermont. And my special guest today is Mark Breen, uh, who is involved with the Fairbanks uh, Museum and Planetarium. Uh, he's the Senior Meteorologist and Planetarium Director at the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium located in beautiful St. Johnsbury, Vermont. And there's so many things to talk to Mark about. We last had Mark on Positively Vermont five years ago, and I'm sure a lot has happened since then. Welcome, Mark. Well, thanks, Dennis. Good. Glad to be here. I just want you to tell our viewers a little bit about yourself first. And oh, sure. Yeah, um, I have been a meteorologist at the Fairbanks Museum uh, for over 35 years now. Um, I uh, originally came up here to uh, to Vermont to go to school, um, Linden State College and now Northern Vermont University Linden uh, had a great meteorology program. Um, and so uh, I came up here specifically to do that. I wasn't anticipating that I was going to stay in Vermont, uh, but then that opportunity came up at the museum. Essentially, the Eye on the Sky program that's on Vermont Public Radio started just as I was finishing school. So the timing was perfect. Uh, I just went from school right into to doing that. And uh, so that's basically, you know, I guess I won't say it's necessarily the majority of my job, but it's a primary part of it. Um, while I was at the museum, I was asked to learn at least enough astronomy to do a public presentation in our planetarium. So, uh, you know, for about oh, six, seven weeks, I read books. I went up in our planetarium and I practiced and uh, basically got hooked on it. Um, you know, it, it just fascinated me in, in terms of one, starting just to recognize the stars and so forth, but then extending that into lots of other uh, uh, sort of areas of interest within astronomy. So, um, and uh, shortly after that became the planetarium director and uh, I've been doing that for over 30 years as well. Tell us a little bit about the uh the uh, Fairbanks Museum, uh, how it uh, got started. I understand it was founded in 1889. Tell us a little bit about the history of the museum and the planetarium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, it's certainly unique to have a, a, such an amazing uh, museum and a planetarium in a town that's uh, relatively, you know, quite small. I mean, St. Johnsbury, uh, the population is only seven or 8,000. And uh, I grew up in a even smaller town down in Connecticut, and we had nothing like this. So um, I, I think uh, Vermont in general, there are a lot of our relatively small communities that have some amazing treasures. And the, the museum's a great example of that, um, comes out of the industrial age in the 1800s. Uh, the Fairbanks family from St. Johnsbury uh, was quite influential, uh, really statewide. A few of the uh, Fairbanks that became governors of Vermont. Um, but in particular, um, they invented the platform scale. They became a very wealthy family. And Franklin Fairbanks, the founder of the museum, wanted to give back to the community. And so he had already been collecting stuff from all around the world. He was just fortunate to be able to, to you know, as a, a very wealthy person, he traveled parts of the world. And he wanted to share that, uh, that experience of, of you know, being in other places. Uh, at least with the local people uh, in St. Johnsbury. And so that's essentially how the museum came to be. Um, the planetarium's a, a much later uh, addition. Um, a director at the time, uh, Fred Mould, he was uh, absolutely fascinated with the uh, science in general. Um, it, there are lots of stories that uh, before I got there, uh, he would lead classes, he would have you know, a, a snake or an owl or a crow right in the, the classroom with him, you know, giving lessons about that. But he was also interested in astronomy. And uh, so uh, with the efforts of uh, the, the town and so forth, created the, the planetarium. It was one of the first planetariums uh, in the Northeastern US and the only uh, public one in Vermont. And uh, so that was in 1960. And so the, uh, the planetarium, uh, is an amazing and also a fairly unique part uh, of, of the institution. I understand it's the only public planetarium in the state. 
Yeah, it remains that there are a few uh, portable planetariums now with some other organizations, and, and we've added that to, to our uh, sort of the things that we do. We have a portable planetarium as well. Um, and of course, you know, I think a lot of people, because of the presence of, of eye in the sky, are familiar with the meteorology and astronomy parts of the museum, but uh, the museum has a large natural history, history collection, um, birds and mammals from around the world, uh, some pretty rare and even extinct species, um, along with a great collection of uh, some bits and pieces from around the world, um, and uh, also uh, some local history as well. Right. Well, the website has a, a great deal of very good information and some photos about those other aspects. And uh, mm -hmm. hopefully yeah. people can look at that. But maybe you could give us a little description of the planetarium itself in terms of the equipment and, and what it's capable of doing and, and uh, various uh, technical aspects of it. Sure. Um, well, uh, about uh, this time two years ago, we were in the process of tilting the dome. Um, the original equipment that went in in 1960 actually lasted for 50 years. Um, the company, uh, Spitz Planetarium Company, was actually amazed that it was still running 50 years later. Uh, but it really had kind of worn itself out. In fact, uh, we couldn't get parts for it anymore. So we changed in uh, 2012, we changed to a new system, which is a computerized system. And there are some pluses and minuses to it. I will, you know, uh, disguise the idea that I don't think the star field is quite as perfect as the other. But on the other hand, uh, we can use this system uh, to fly around the solar system. You can take an orbit around the Earth or the moon. You can even fly out of the solar system. So there are a number of, of capabilities that it has added uh, to what we can do. It's a relatively small planetarium. Uh, it uh, seats a, a maximum of 35 people. Um, with, and we now have some uh, flexible seating, which we didn't have before. And what that allows us to do is, is you know, especially if we have a, a kid's group, maybe a Boy Scout group or a Girl Scout group or something, you know, they'll come in and we can just move the chairs out of the way and they can kind of relax on the floor and look up at the sky, uh, just as though they were laying outside in the field. I will never forget my field trip uh, in grammar school to the Hayden Planetarium. And in New York mm -hmm. City, that was such a such a thrill at the time, particularly with the space uh, program getting launched. You know, it was right. just, uh, yeah. amazing to see all that stuff at the same time. The space was getting in the news every every hour during those days. Yeah, and and of course, you know, uh, even present day, you know, there are a lot of different things that are going on with astronomy, uh, different missions to different planets uh, or uh, comets in the sky, and we can much more easily with this new system be able to immediately present that information for folks so they can you know get a one a sense of what what it is that they're looking at but we also have some some terrific presenters that are able to you know translate that into uh you know basically you know just an everyday kind of person what are they looking at and why is it important that's great well i understand that there's some exciting uh, things coming up and the museum itself is going to open, reopen at the end of the, this month. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, so every year for the past several years, we have closed in the month of January. It's a, it's a month that, you know, we don't have a, obviously a lot of visitors from out of town that, that come through. And so we've taken advantage of that. We close the museum. It allows us to basically open up all the exhibit cases, do some really si uh, significant cleaning, but it also uh, has allowed us to refurbish um, and you know, represent some of those collections that we have. And so that's what we're doing again this year. With the pandemic, uh, obviously visitation would be low anyway. So we've extended that uh, into the month of February, but uh, the last weekend in February, we will reopen. Um, we've redone in particular, um, there was a long exhibit case that had a lot of uh, mostly birds and a few mammals from Vermont. Well, they've been the same since I came here almost 40 years ago, and it was time to do something. Um, and, and so that has that entire case and all of the different uh, specimens in there have been kind of redesigned, reimagined, so to say. I mean, it's still, they're still in a case. There's no question about it. But um, you, know, you have much more information to go on. Uh, it, it certainly has been refurbished and updated. So that's one of the, the many things that, that uh, we've been working on. 
Um, and of course, uh, we're pretty excited because once we get into spring and the ground thaws, we're going to be adding to the museum. Tell us about that science annex that's um, been added. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this is something that we've been working on kind of behind the scenes for the past couple of years. Um, uh, any endeavor like this, you know, we're doing basically a major addition to the museum, the first one since the museum uh, was built. And in order to do that, obviously, it takes a lot of resources. So we've been doing a lot of work, like I said, behind the scenes. But uh, uh, at the end of this past fall, we were finally able to announce that starting uh, either late April or early May, we're going to break ground and we're going to build what we know as the science annex. And uh, the idea with it is to do a, kind of a, a multitude of things, but the primary purposes are to give us room so that we can do some hands-on science exhibits, which is something the museum had many years ago, and then various things change over the years. We've instituted some of that again, but because there are a lot of programs at the museum with meteorology and astronomy, that's what we're gonna focus in on. On the other hand, you know, it's, it's a large addition. And so there are other opportunities here, including uh, working with the Community College of Vermont, uh, St. Johnsbury's uh, uh, particular um, you know, branch of that. They've been kind of looking for a new home and a lot of their programming fits in with a lot of the programming that we do. And so they're going to be part of our new addition. Uh, and it also, and this is one of the things that we've always been trying to do, but in keeping with the museum, we wanted to add handicap access to our second floor. But that's always been a challenge because of the structure of the museum. It is a historic building, so we can't make a lot of whole scale changes to it. Um, but this has allowed us to be able to do that. Um, and we're taking advantage of, of some, uh, well, very Vermont, very modern sort of techniques. We're using something called mass timber construction. Uh, so it kind of promotes the Vermont forestry industry. Um, and it also is a renewable resource. So in terms of, you know, the addition, the resources that we're using, it's a, a very green uh, sort of addition as far as that goes. So we're, um, you know, trying to incorporate all of the, the things that the museum kind of stands for, you know, that the museum is, is there to help uh, promote, the, you know, stewardship of the earth and that type of thing. So uh, we're, we're trying to incorporate that as part of the addition. Tell us about some of these uh, COVID safe outdoor exhibits that will be going on. Right. So um, this is something that we obviously had to figure out last summer. Um, the museum didn't close, but uh, well, for example, the planetarium that we've been talking about, and it does seat 35 people, but it's in a very small enclosed space. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there was no way to be able to open that to the public uh, during this past summer. So what we did is we actually created a space on our front porch um, and put out some benches that were safely distanced and, and had a large screen. And we did astronomy presentations. They weren't necessary. I mean, I, it's not like a dome. There's no question about it. On the other hand, we were able to highlight different things that people could go outside and see on the upcoming evenings. We talked about the comet that was visible last summer. Um, you know, all of those kind of things we still incorporated into our programming that was just simply outside. Another thing that we had that was outside that we knew as the butterfly house. Um, and in that, uh, what we do each spring, uh, we bring in new plantings and we also have uh, the, the various chrysalises and, uh, of the uh, either moths or, or uh, butterflies and they hatch out and we get generally um, native species. So there are approximately five or six that we concentrate on. Um, and, but about midsummer or so when they've all hatched out, it's pretty cool to just walk in and, you know, the butterflies are all around you. Um, they're landing on different plants and lots of information about that. So we're going to be doing that again this summer. We have changed that slightly. Um, we've made a somewhat more permanent addition to the backyard of the museum. Um, it's a large greenhouse-like building, uh, but it's a, a very large building. So again, 
with, with the socially distance, uh, you know, we can still uh, do not only butterflies, but we've been able to extend our seasons for our education program. Mm -hmm. We use it as kind of a three season room where during the spring and well into the fall, we can do some outdoor programming where we'll do something just briefly as a classroom type of setting. And then we can walk immediately out of that into the museum's backyard and we can do things. Well, for example, um, I did an astronomy program not too long ago, well, back in the fall, but um, we were able to have the kids create the solar system. We had uh, one student who was the sun and then we had, you know, Mercury and Mars literally going around them, but we could do that outside. Um, and so those are the kinds of programs that we anticipate doing uh, through the summer. That's wonderful. And, and tell us a, a, about uh, some of the things that are going to be going on in the universe that you're in tune with right now. Yeah, I think the, the one thing that I've been paying close attention to um, is uh, the Mars, the next Mars rover, um, which is uh, almost ready to land, uh, lands on February 18th. In fact, I think it lands at five minutes before four o'clock, which is pretty amazing to think, you know, they launched it several months ago and they've got it down to the minute in terms of when it's going to land. Uh, but those are the kind of calculations that go into a successful program. And uh, fortunately, uh, we've been very successful in, in recent missions. They have a, a lot of uh, successful missions. And so this is the next in the generation of rovers that will be landing there. Um, and uh, so again, that'll, that'll be landing on February 18th and usually takes a few days for it to kind of test out all of its equipment, so forth, get settled in. So I anticipate uh, some really cool pictures coming along as we get into the months of March uh, and April. Um, I believe its mission uh, length is six months, uh, but very often the way that uh, NASA designs things, uh, for example, the Curiosity rover, that's still operating many years after its initial mission uh, had, had finished up. Well, how, how will you interact with that? Do you have any arrangements with uh, other uh, entities such as NASA to monitor this? Uh, how will you participate in, in the Mars landing? So mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one of the things that, that NASA has increasing, uh, increasingly done a, a great job with is providing planetariums like ourselves um, with sort of up-to-date videos. So in other words, uh, as they do some sort of exploration, I uh, you know one of the things that they uh, concentrated on is finding uh, evidence of water on Mars's surface or just underneath the surface. And so um, Mars has a sort of a science branch to it that's committed to education programs like ours. And so we will get various videos and, um, you know, even activities that, that we can get students to participate in just so they can better understand what's, what's going on. Uh, with the current mission. That sounds really interesting. And uh, uh, there was a comet Leonard uh, that uh, you observed. Tell us about that uh, comet. Right. Um, that was just discovered last month, uh, the month of January, just after the turn of the year. It's the first comet discovered uh, in 2021. Um, each year there are very often between 20 and sometimes as many as 40 comets discovered. And about out of, let's say, 20 either 19 or 20 of them aren't visible to the naked eye. I mean, it is just, you know, most comets are quite small, quite faint. They're telescope objects, which is great for people that are studying them. But, you know, for you and I, you know, you want to go outside and mm -hmm. see something. Well, of course, last summer, we had the, the fortune of seeing Comet Neowise. Um, that's just an acronym for a telescope that discovered it. Uh, but the idea was that all of a sudden you walk outside. I remember my, my daughter-in-law was uh, visiting from Southern New Hampshire and, you know, we walked outside, walked down the street because this was visible right in the middle of town at St. Johnsbury. And all of a sudden there it was. So with that in mind, uh, Comet Leonard may be a, un, an, in, well, they call it a naked eye uh, comet. In other words, you don't need any special equipment. You should be able to walk outside and see with your eye. It may get that bright in December. So it's still a long ways away. <laughs> uh, somebody uh, sort of gave the idea that predicting comets is something like predicting cats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, they, they're just, 
you know, they are going to do whatever they're going to do. They're very independent that way. Um, it could be bright. It could be dull and we won't really see much of anything at all. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, one thing that I did find out about this comet, this comet, its approximate orbit is somewhere around 800,000 years. So <laughs> it's been a long time since it came by the sun. And in this particular case, they don't think it's going to come back. And if they're wrong, who's going to know? Um, <laughs> but uh, because it is, uh, it's a comet that either has only gone by the sun perhaps once or uh, maybe not, uh, not anywhere close to the sun, comets that are new don't tend to be very predictable. Um, and that, that we've, uh, you know, basically, um, uh, some folks will remember Comet Kahootek way back in the 1970s. Comet Kahootek was supposed to be the comet of the century and everybody was so excited and it turned out to be kind of a dud. But what we found out was that it was a new visitor to the inner part of the solar system. Comets that are first time visitors, so to say, they don't always produce spectacular displays. Sometimes they do though, so I guess we'll know in December. That's great. Well, one of the things I like to uh, uh, ask you about it is the online astronomy programs uh, that you have that people can participate mm -hmm. in. Tell us about those. Yeah, um, I think it takes a little exploring. Um, I, I guess one, one thing that came to mind just the other day uh, was that, that old TV show, uh, So You Think You're Smarter Than a Fifth Grader. Well, this is pretty much the challenge because a lot of our programs, uh, just because of the nature of the museum, you know, we focus in on school groups. And so a lot of our programs are focused on teaching kids. But I've had any number of uh, adults who have either been in some of our kids' programs or they picked up some kids' books and so forth. It's a great way to get introduced to something that you're not otherwise familiar with. So uh, I say that as a way of exploring uh, our various programs that we have. And you can either get to them by going to the Fairbanks Museum's website, which is simple, fairbanksmuseum.org, or uh, you can go to our YouTube channel, just, you know, uh, just search for Fairbanks Museum and all kinds of programs will, will appear. And uh, one of the series of programs, and I believe it's listed somewhere in the like sixth, seventh, and eighth grade section, uh, but this is definitely, uh, you know, a, a great uh, kind of series of programs talking about the motions that you see in, in the solar system. We watch the moon, but the moon changes every night that you look at it. We watch the planets and they change over weeks and months. We watch the stars and they change over weeks and then seasons. And so, it, you know, these programs are basically designed to give you an introduction to what you can go outside and observe in the sky. Tell us a little bit about, uh, I, I read a lot about the, how the, the pandemic uh, has changed the light patterns or light pollution that's emitted by uh, big cities. And how has the pandemic changed uh, the, the night sky, the visibility of the night sky? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know that it's changed it a great deal locally. Um, you know, our, our population is, is lower. Um, at the same time, though, I think it has changed people's uh, well time structure just in general. Uh, many of us will be working at home or at home more often. The kids are at home more often, um, and we're not going out and doing other things. And so uh, I've had any number of people that have contacted me. In fact, just the other day, I had done a program on astronomy uh, through uh, it was the Norwich Public Library, um, and afterward. Uh, there were a couple of families that contacted me saying, we just took a telescope out of the basement, you know, it had been collecting dust. And so they brought it out. And basically the question was, okay, what next? Um, and so I think people are finding that whether it's a, a matter of finally having time to do something or maybe just appreciating the fact that maybe all the other busy stuff that we did wasn't as important or fulfilling or whatever. Um, and so he, here's an opportunity and it's, it's a great family uh, uh, activity. It's also a great, you know, neighborhood type of thing is to get out there and start, you know, appreciating 
what's been there all the time, you know, taking a look at the sky, understanding different planets and so forth. I have a few friends that, you know, they're often asking me, well, I just saw this bright object, you know, it was, I was out walking my dog at four in the morning. What was I, what was I looking at? And so, you know, I certainly think the pandemic has uh, re caused all of us to kind of reevaluate, you know, what do we find that's important? What do we want to do that we've been putting off? You know, that kind of thing. That's great. I, I bought a telescope myself, and I, I just haven't had the time to calibrate it or, or get it working. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I, I just, uh, I love it, because as a kid, we used to do this. We used to try to see flying saucers, of course, or uh, <laughs> the aircraft or whatever, you know. But uh, certainly, I, I've been reinvigorated uh, in, in the concept. Uh, just the walking out in the morning here, it's just beautiful. You can see the moon and the uh, and the sun mm -hmm. up, and it's just an amazing environment that we have. Tell us a little bit about that environment up by the by the museum. Uh, what's it like for, for stargazing by uh, just the visitors or people who live there? Sure. Um, well, you know, we're really fortunate that uh, so many places uh, uh, in Vermont, you know, we have relatively dark skies. You know, we have some small villages and and you know, very small cities certainly. And so, if you're not in this place that has dark skies, you don't have to go very far to, to do that. Um, and so uh, that's certainly, that is one of the key things in terms of seeing the sky is to really have, you know, a dark location. Now, having said that, you know, because uh, I, I live right in uh, St. Johnsbury. And so yes, there are street lights around, but um, in my backyard, as long as I don't trip the motion sensor light, it's dark enough in my backyard that if I look straight up, I can see the Milky Way, which is a relatively faint, you know, feature in the sky. Um, so I, I think, you know, finding, you know, maybe there's a, a spot that's not far from where you live that maybe that's an easy place to get to. I think I've always found that convenience is an important part of uh, pursuing something like that. So in other words, if it's really difficult to find a place to look at the stars, you're just not going to do it very often. But if it's relatively easy, like I said, in my backyard, it's in the middle of a, a small village, but I can see the sky. And so if it's convenient uh, and you have the time, and again, with this pandemic, you know, people have found that suddenly they do have some time, um, then I think that that's a, a, a plus right there. But, but we are fortunate that we don't have a lot of light pollution and we really can see deep into the night sky. That's wonderful. Well, tell us a, a little bit about uh, how the public can get involved, or organizations that can interact with you or support your efforts. Tell us about how the uh, museum functions. I understand there's a, a membership, uh, and uh, tell us about that membership and, and volunteers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so yeah, there are a lot of ways that you can kind of participate in what the museum is doing. Um, now, uh, in terms of volunteers, we have a number of, of people that volunteer in different aspects of the museum. We have a large collection of, of items that they're not necessarily always on display, but it's a really important to preserve those items so that uh, somebody that wants to, for example, do some research, you know, do we have that, uh, you know, those very, you know, unique and, and precious items and they're, you know, preserved, uh, hopefully, you know, as best as possible for years and years to come. Um, and so it might depend on your interest. Um, you know, if you're interested, for example, in birds and mammals, uh, there would be some opportunities that way. Uh, if you're interested in something like textiles, I mean, we have a wide range of collections and so a wide range of interests uh, uh, available for people. The other thing, of course, that you mentioned, you know, memberships, uh, the museum uh, really depends on having memberships because that allows us to do many of the things, you know, whether it's preserving and, and researching various things in our collection, uh, but it also, you know, let's face it, the, the building has to stay warm in the winter. All of those things are really critical um, and membership is, is a really great way to do that. And this is, you know, it's a two-way street. You get a membership, obviously you can come into the museum for free, uh, you can come to the planetarium for free, uh, but in addition to that, um, you also get various announcements about programs that are going on at the museum. Um, and we have some special members programs. So if you are a member, you get invited to, to certain programs. And 
boy, one of our favorite things to do, we have uh, a couple of very social events. Obviously, we've had to curtail those uh, during the past uh, 12 months or so, but uh, anticipating that uh, maybe this fall we'll get back to, to a more normal sort of pattern that way. But when we do, and I know we will, then just imagine having a party in the museum. I mean, oh, what a great place. I mean, you've, you've got one, you'll invite your friends. So you've got, you know, you know, friends and family that you're going to be enjoying this with. Uh, but um, it's a very social atmosphere, very different than it's not like some stuffy old science museum, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's really those kinds of things are, are great fun. And so that's, again, just a, a, a benefit of being uh, a member. Um, and then finally, you know, we just mentioned that the museum is making a major expansion. We have raised about 90% of the funding for that, but we still have a little bit more to go. And so uh, if, if you're a person that, that really feels committed to making sure that, you know, science continues to, to be, you know, flourish, um, that kids continue to learn about it, that adults continue to learn about it, um, then supporting uh, the museum through, you know, uh, some kind of donation toward uh, our new uh, expansion, that would be a, a way to support the museum as well. That's right. A tax time is coming up, so people might want to think about that. Well, there you go. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, this has really been very exciting. and I'm really thankful that you're able to uh, meet with us today and explain uh, what's going on. And maybe when, when uh, we get back to normal times, uh, we can uh, review some of the activities that have been taking place uh, at that time. And uh, we always love to have you. It's been five years. I can't believe it. But uh, we have to get you back. <laughs> we have to get you back a lot sooner than that. Yes. Well, um, I, let's let's make sure that it isn't another five years from now. Right. Time, so. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you very much, Mark, uh, uh, for, for being our guest today on Positively Vermont. Uh, this is Dennis McMahon. My guest today has been Mark Breen, the Senior Meteorologist and Planetarium Director at the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. Uh, thanks for watching.